Terror attacks are on the rise across the African continent. From Somalia and Kenya in the east to Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali in the west. Extremist groups are exploiting ethnic tensions, poverty and political instability to sow fear, chaos and death. But who are they and what do they hope to achieve? And what is happening with the efforts to stop them? We'll look at the trail of destruction left behind, talk to our team of international reporters to find out what the United States and other nations are doing to stem the tide. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Jim Malone, filling in for Greta Van Susteren. Intelligence experts say terrorist attacks are declining around the world, but across the African continent, the threat of terror-related violence looms large. Just this year alone, about a dozen African countries have endured a surge of deadly attacks that have killed thousands. From Somalia in the east, Libya in the north, and in the west, Cameroon, Nigeria, Mali, and Burkina Faso. It is there where a bad situation appears to be getting worse. In April, 65 people were killed in attacks by armed Islamists who are trying to use Burkina Faso as a foothold in West Africa's Sahel region, the transitional area between the desert to the north and the savanna to the south. The U.S. has significant military assets in the region. VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb got a rare look inside the U.S. counter-terror efforts in Burkina Faso. In the vast, dusty plateau of West Africa's Sahel region, the fight is heating up against an insurgency fueled by Islamist militants. Burkina Faso has seen more than 230 attacks in just over three years, with no end to the violence in sight. What we fight against, what we see every day, is like a toxin. A toxin that the U.S. ambassador to Burkina Faso tells VOA has quickly spread across a nation virtually untouched by terrorism just a few years ago. They're trying to target the resilience of this community which has lived in harmony for thousands of years. There are Muslims and Christians who are in the same family. Those terrorist groups try to break down a stable uh, society and attack a fragile democracy. Because instability provides terrorists an opening to infiltrate. It happened in Iraq and Somalia. And now, the commander of U.S. Special Forces in Africa tells VOA Islamist years, groups are planting their years, flags years, here. We know that al-Qaeda considers um, the Sahel right here to be a, a very important area for them to deliberately and quietly build infrastructure. Uh, they've been doing this for a number of years and they've been fairly successful. Which is why Hicks says training exercises with Sahel Nation forces are critical. American commandos and international allies teach everything from how to plan operations to how to respond to an ambush to how to treat and evacuate the wounded. Skills that regional partners say make a big difference. Unfortunately, we lost two guys or two, our guys during some operation. And if we had this uh, knowledge, maybe we could be able to take care of them. <laughs> putting tourniquet before taking them to the hospitals. Okay. The U.S. Embassy has heeded the call, giving more funding to Burkina Faso for security assistance. But instead of bringing in more troops, the U.S. is actually decreasing its numbers in West Africa. About 1,000 American troops will remain in the region. And General Hicks says that's still enough forces to help build local security partners. Together, I think we can turn the tide. And this is going to be a long-term problem. But he does not recommend any more cuts. Is the United States winning the counter-terror war here? I would tell you at this time we are not winning. And officials say if the terrorists win in Burkina Faso, it could turn into a launch pad for terrorists to expand their influence to West Africa's coast and potentially beyond. 
The United States has also funded training for law enforcement units who would likely serve as first responders in the event of attacks in the capital, Ouagadougou. Now, VOA correspondent uh, Carla Babb, who covers the Pentagon, is back from her tour in Burkina Faso. She joins us now to discuss the U.S. military commitment in the region. Welcome to you. Thanks for your reporting. Give us a sense what's going on on the ground there. Well, it's pretty bad. I mean, over the past year, the violence has hit Burkina Faso like a freight train coming full speed ahead at the people. There have been a 100,000 people displaced because of this violence, according to the United Nations. Um, even more than that, 150,000 children can't go to school. Thousands of teachers can't teach in their classrooms. I spoke with a couple of those teachers when I was there, and one of them was threatened to either you know, speak in Arabic or leave the school, so he had to leave because he doesn't speak Arabic. And then another one, they burned down his school, so he had to flee to the capital. So you picked up on a sense of fear and tension among the local population with this threat. Absolutely. And, you know, over the past three years, the military is kind of figuring out what to do. They were totally surprised by this. I just spoke with Ambassador Young, and he told me that the military has launched an offensive in the east and that they've been able to reopen some schools and take some territory back. But it's still unclear. That's only step one, you know, when you're able to get people back in and make them feel safe. Now, you quoted, uh, you had a, a clip of the interview there with one of our commanders there who you asked him straight out, are we winning? He said, no, we're not winning. So if they're not winning, what's going on? Is it a stalemate, or how would you describe the situation? Well, he said, when he said we, he meant the United States, the allies, and all of those G5 Sahel forces there are not winning. And so the strategy for the United States and France, France is the major international ally there because uh, in West Africa, they're, they're French colonies. But they're basically deciding um, to train a group of people because it's not just Burkina Faso's problem. It's not just Niger's or Mali's problem. These terrorists are spilling across the borders, and so it's a group problem. So that's where the training is being focused now rather than going out with individual units a lot. Group them together, teach them how to, to understand when one group of terrorists crosses the border. Right. The other group, um, the military needs to be there on the other side to stop them. So it, it seems as though the U.S. looks at this with some sense of urgency, and yet we're hearing about cuts. So uh, how do they kind of, uh, you know, reconcile those two thoughts? It's a little muddy, to be honest, because uh, you speak to the ambassador and he says that while the State Department has made cuts elsewhere, they've not seen cuts in Burkina Faso. They've tripled the security assistance there um, and they've tripled the economic assistance there as well because they realize that these um, extremism problems stem from a lack of economic development. The U.S. military has this motto that they never want to go into a fair fight and they're trying to make it so their allies in West, West Africa don't have a fair fight. They have this extra equipment and financing. One last one, you know, during your stint there and from talking to the Americans and the locals, do you get a sense that they, they figured that they are on the front lines in the war on terror right now? Oh, absolutely. They all realize the seriousness of this. And the United States is watching it closely. While there are some troops that are moving out, um, they moved about 150 out of West Africa, I've been told. 300 have been removed from the continent so far. Uh, while there are people moving out, the locals are taking care of the situation for now because if it breaches through Burkina Faso and if it expands in Niger and Mali, then it can go to the coast. And then if they have that coastal territory, then they can really expand beyond. So as long as the United States sees that they cannot carry out attacks right. against the United States, they're going to keep doing what they feel is working in a sense. Well, Carla Babb, thanks very much. Thanks for your reporting and thanks for joining us and Plugged In. Absolutely. Some 7,000 kilometers east of Burkina Faso is the Horn of Africa, where the terrorist organization Al-Shabaab has established a record of violence for the past 15 years. More now on the origins of Al-Shabaab from Plugged In's Velikia Newsom. Al-Shabaab translated to the youth in Arabic, was formed in 2006 as an outgrowth of the Islamic Courts Union, a more moderate Islamist group that briefly took control of Somalia that year. Most of al-Shabaab's founders were trained by al-Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan and absorbed Osama bin Laden's belief in violent jihad as the way to impose a fundamentalist version of Islamic law on society. 
Al-Shabaab took over much of Somalia in 2009 and nearly toppled the government, but was ultimately pushed back by African Union forces. Since then, Al-Shabaab has carried out many suicide attacks in the Somali capital, most notoriously a truck bombing that killed 587 people in October 2017. It has also mounted several high-profile attacks in Kenya in retaliation for Kenya's involvement with the AU force in Somalia. The deadliest was an assault on Garissa College in 2015 that killed 148 people. This January, Shabab fighters killed 21 at the Dusit D2 hotel complex in Nairobi. The group has said its goal is to create a strict Islamist state in Somalia, although from the start, some leaders have nurtured dreams of creating a larger caliphate across the region. For more about al-Shabaab, we welcome in VOA senior editor Dan Joseph. He co-wrote a book titled Inside al-Shabaab, The Secret History of Al-Qaeda's Most Powerful Ally. It is indeed a fascinating look at al-Shabaab and its history. Uh, Dan, thanks for joining us. And maybe we could start with kind of an update from your perspective. What's going on in the conflict at the moment? The main activity at the moment is the continued U.S. airstrikes in Somalia against al-Shabaab and occasionally against the Islamic State faction, which exists in the northern part of the country. Uh, ever since uh, Donald Trump took office in 2017, he's given the U.S. military greater latitude to attack al-Shabaab targets in Somalia. And so there, have, there were 35 airstrikes that year, 45 last year, and already more than 20 so far this year. Uh, Any indication what kind of impact they're having on the battlefield at this point? It hasn't really changed the stalemate that goes on there. Uh, for the last few years, Amazon, the African Union mission in Somalia, has been protecting the Somali central government. Uh, and al-Shabaab has attacked soft targets like hotels and restaurants, and occasionally they've attacked Amazon bases in remote areas. But al-Shabaab continues to pose a threat to Somali civilians and certainly the government. Uh, the airstrikes may have pushed more al-Shabaab fighters into Mogadishu, where it is relatively safe since the U.S. is not going to attack, uh, not going to bomb an area where there are a lot of civilians. But uh, I have to say it's still a stalemate. Well, what is the, is there a strategy from the African Union point of view about how are they more aggressively going after, uh, you know, al-Shabaab at this point? Is it more of a stalemate? How would you assess that? They have not aggressively gone after al-Shabaab since about 2014. In the earlier part of this decade, there was a strong offensive by, led by Amazon that pushed al-Shabaab out of major uh, Somali cities. Uh, since about 2014, though, neither the political will nor the military might seems to have been there to really drive back al-Shabaab. And right now, it, it's, it's basically a stalemate. The U.S. is certainly delivering body blows to al-Shabaab, but nothing to knock it out. Uh, Thomas Waldhauser, the head of AFRICOM, told the Senate Armed Services Committee that the airstrikes going on right now are not going to finish off al-Shabaab. What about concerns in the region? I mean, we've seen attacks, Kenya, Uganda. I mean, I assume the regional African nations there still see al-Shabaab as a very uh, viable threat. Oh, it's a, it's a very potent threat, as we saw in January when they attacked the uh, hotel and co office complex in Nairobi. Um, but I don't think there's the political will to launch an offensive that would eliminate al-Shabaab once and for all, nor are they taking steps to withdraw the 20,000 plus Amazon troops in Somalia and leaving the conflict to the Somalis themselves. If they did that, it's very likely that the Somali government would be facing a dire existential threat from al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab almost did take over the country in 2009 and 2010. Just a few seconds left, but is there any thought that a long-term strategy would somehow lead to a viable Somali government that could stand on its own there? People have been hoping for that for many years now. Um, Somalis still seem to be divided too much by clan and by other local interests to unify into a strong, lasting central government. So there, there's always hope, but right now that doesn't seem to be on the horizon. Well, Dan Joseph, who uh, edits all things Africa for us here at VOA, thanks very much for being on the program today.
The United States may need to significantly change its approach toward extremists in Africa and around the world. That's because a new report suggests the U.S. war on terror is not working. The blunt assessment by the bipartisan task force on extremism in fragile states is the result of a years-long study that looked at the outcomes of military campaigns in the Middle East, Africa, and beyond. Plugged In's Mil Arcega has more. After nearly two decades and an estimated $5.9 trillion, the report concludes that U.S. military efforts to fight extremism are ultimately unsustainable. The report states that if terrorism is the symptom, then extremism, the ideology of totalitarian control, is a disease. By treating only the symptoms, the report warns U.S. policy is doomed to an endless cycle of military responses. Instead, the task force suggests the U.S. and its partners prioritize prevention over military engagement. The report suggests that even modest preventive investments, reducing economic or political instability, for example, in failing states, can reduce the ability of extremists to exploit fragile countries. The findings are gaining momentum on Capitol Hill. You literally cannot kill your way into winning this battle against extremism. I've always said that bullets and bombs alone cannot defeat an ideology. Both have expressed support for the report's key recommendation, wholesale changes in U.S. counterterrorism strategy. Such changes would mean fewer troops on the ground, greater investments to counter extremist ideology, and more money to bolster fragile nations at risk of collapse. But it also recommends doing so with a sense of urgency. The study finds terror attacks have increased five-fold since 2001. And despite ceding territory to Western-backed forces, the number of jihadist fighters has more than tripled. Milar Sega, VOA News, Washington. And to help us unpack U.S. security concerns and methods to deter extremism in Africa, we are joined by VOA national security correspondent Jeff Selden. Jeff, good to see you. Thanks for being on the program today. Glad to be here. Where does the strategy in Africa, the threats being posed in Africa, where does that fit in with the overall U.S. counterterrorism approach? Well, it's, it's high on the priority list for U.S. counterterrorism. Ever since the fall of the Islamic State Caliphate back in March, U.S. senior officials have been talking about where does the Islamic State in particular go next. And parts of some of the places they point to, North Africa, Libya in particular, where the Islamic State has managed to hold on despite several years ago nearly being wiped out there. And again, they're not even the biggest terrorist group. Other groups such as Al-Qaeda and others have more pull there. But still, there's big concern about Islamic State. They also look at uh, southern uh, part of Central Africa, where you have lots of economic problems, where you have many of the migrants that are coming to Europe and trying to make their way across the Mediterranean. Lots of that is starting there, so they worry about that part of the country. And of course, as you, as you move into Somalia, as, as we just heard, there are right. concerns there. And then you get into the connections over to the Middle East. So there are lots of routes by which terrorists can make their way to Africa, lots of routes by which they can make their way out. And that's high on the list. And we're hearing it's a priority and high on the list, as you say. And yet they are making some cuts here in terms of military commitments in the area. Do we risk kind of a uh, contradictory message going out? Well, there's a conflict within U.S. policy right now, because on the one hand, you have the U.S. national defense strategy, which places the emphasis on what is called the era of great power competition. And those powers are primarily Russia and China. On the other hand, you have the U.S. counterterrorism strategy, which worries about the rise of the Salafi jihadist fighters around the world. The fact that even with the collapse of the Islamic State, and remember, at one point it was thought that if the U.S. and its allies could collapse and cause the Islamic State to lose its territory in Iraq and Syria, that would de deliver a severe enough blow that the ideology would no longer catch on. But it hasn't played out that way. The ideology has been as viral as ever. Right. So you have these two different strategies, and they're competing with each other because there are limited resources. And so the, the challenge now is how do you reconcile the two? Right. And the, recently the director of strategic operations for the National Counterterrorism Center was warning that they're not disconnected, that the great power competition in Africa, the activities of Russia and China 
are creating more fertile ground for terrorism because some of those activities are destabilizing. They're creating the fragile states which terrorists and groups like Islamic State right. and Al-Qaeda are so very good at preying well, on. Well, speaking of creating the conditions for terrorism, how much of this is in the end, according to U.S. officials or from their view, a military type solution? And how much of this is getting at some of these underlying problems, especially in a number of African countries, so-called failed states, corrupt governments, uh, places where the borders are not always secure, uh, and just there's a lot of instability? Uh, how do we try to address those issues as well? It's a very interesting question. Several years ago, when Islamic State was near or at its peak, uh, a senior Pentagon official told me that you can keep sending in the military and they can take out every single terrorist but once you pull the military out give it a six months maybe a year but those groups those terrorists will be back in some way shape or form and so while there is a military role there are military officials who see clearly that there is a need to do more to do much of the advanced work that the report on fragile states was talking about to get at some of these underlying issues but again, it's a matter of limited resources plus the complications of the great power competition because you have Russia in the case of Central Africa, which is going in with mercenaries and forging deals with the government in order to stabilize the government there. You have China, which is promising economic aid, and some countries, even though there's been indications that those deals don't always work out well, right. there are countries that have been taking the aid because they need that money now, they need that help now. Right. So you have these various factors, plus there's one more. You have the, the threat of transnational crime. You have all these criminal networks, the black markets in Africa, which are being used by both criminals and by the terrorists to move around, make money, and finance their activities. Just a few seconds, but it sounds like it's going to be a long-term commitment to try to hold the hold the line in some of these areas in terms of terrorism. It's, it's going to be a long-term commitment from the military perspective. We've seen the U.S. tout this by with through approach, trying to create right. partners on the ground. But then again, you have the danger because partners on the ground can be viewed as proxies. Other nations are very good at using proxies, too. Jeff Selden, thanks very much for being unplugged in today. Well, there's lots at stake for countries that do business in African nations. Germany's Chancellor and Britain's Foreign Secretary are just the latest in a flurry of recent high-profile visitors seeking to expand trade engagement and bolster security on the continent. In March, French President Emmanuel Macron signed business deals in Kenya worth $2.2 billion. And last month, White House advisor and first daughter Ivanka Trump visited Ethiopia and Ivory Coast to invest in women in developing countries. But while American companies are still the biggest source of foreign direct investment in Africa, China has recently gained notoriety as Africa's biggest trading partner and largest financier of infrastructure projects. The big question is, why is there so much interest in Africa from so many different countries? To explain why security and stability on the African continent are so important, we're joined now by VOA's Vincent McCory. He's the managing editor for television for VOA's English to Africa division. Vincent, great to see you uh, here on the uh, Anchor it's Set. It's a pleasure to be here, Jim. Very good. Uh, I want to get your sense in terms of an overall feeling uh, among African nations about these terrorist threats. I mean, it, it seems to have popped up intensively in the last several years. Yes. How are they kind of reconciling to this fact that it's going to be a long-term struggle for them? You see, uh, Africa had been embroiled in so many conflicts over the decades you know, across the continent, and, but, uh, but those nations knew exactly what they were dealing with. Um, they kind of knew their, uh, their, their way of operating and therefore they could confront them in uh, some kind of systematic way, whether they, they expected them to last long or not. But the terrorist organizations came with a completely different approach, you know, this uh, uh, sudden explosion of violence, uh, and, and, and they didn't know how to approach them. These are kind of a faceless guys who uh, somehow organize in some dark places and suddenly come and uh, cause all this mayhem in your city. And, and, and they didn't know how to do this, how to, to fight them. They didn't have a strategy. And, and because of the image, just not only the violence, but uh, whatever, the, what it did to the images of these countries, it has become a great threat to uh, the, you know, 
the economies of these nations because tourism is undermined, but also investors are scared of coming to um, mm -hmm. some of these nations. Right. And, and so the African nations recognize that this is, uh, they're in for the long haul. Right. But the challenge is that they did not have the resources, they didn't have the capacity, they did not have the strategy right. to confront terrorist organizations. Now, many countries are working with allies like the U.S., other European allies. How are the African nations working together, though? I mean, I look at the, the African Union effort to counter yeah. al-Shabaab. I mean, I assume there are some ups and downs yes. on this. The African nations have never had a unified approach to it any of these issues. And, and therefore, there have been uh, some regional collaborations and cooperation. But uh, when you look at, for example, what is happening in Somalia, and, and uh, it's sucked in some of these regional forces, but at the same time, uh, Kenya has to deal with the threat, for example, of Al-Qaeda, uh, of uh, Al-Shabaab, which is based in Somalia. Right. Uh, Kenya does not seem to have a common strategy with Somalia. It, it's trying to confront uh, Al-Shabaab on its own, on its side of the border, but at the same time trying to help Somalia deal with uh, Al-Qaeda uh, sponsored uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Then we have Ethiopia, which has a totally different approach and totally different strategy. Right. Uh, there hasn't been a collaborative effort from, say, at the level of the African Union, other than the formation of the AMISOM. Let, let me ask you about something more deeper, though. There's a military kind of way to address these problems. But what about on the deeper level of uh, poverty, yeah. instability uh, that and, we, and, you and I both know for exactly. years have, have yeah. been issues? And in this Africa. has been the frustration. Most of the African nations say, well, they have uh, other pressing issues and issues like uh, unemployment of the youth, poverty, it lend some of these young people to uh, influences of those uh, terrorist organizations. They are susceptible to being recruited. So uh, one of the approaches that... Uh, most of these nations are saying uh, it would work best, and especially in collaboration with uh, ally, the Western allies, is to tackle poverty, education, therefore uh, kind of avail to them resources that will help them to give their youth uh, something better to do so that they are not left to, uh, to uh, the mercy of these uh, terrorist organizations. A little less than a minute left, but yeah. you know, as, as we look to the future, yeah. uh, do you see African nations becoming more adapted to the long-term sort of commitment that's going to be needed to counter these threats? I, I, you know, they have no choice because uh, the, the, the threats are actually undermining some of this, uh, uh, you know, the economies of these countries. But uh, the, the issues are so complex because they also have their own internal conflict. And there is resistance sometimes from the citizens. For example, in Nigeria and Kenya, the Muslim communities have been uh, kind of uh, pushing back at some of the strategies to fight uh, that are anti-terrorism uh, kind of focus because they see them as almost also being anti-Muslim anti-Islam and all that. Uh, but it is something now that is a reality and they, there's no escaping the fact that they have to work with the Western powers and others who have the intention and, uh, and, 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 and the wherewithal, of course, to help them uh, fight these terrorist organizations. Vincent McCurry, great to see you and thanks for your insights. It's a, it's a pleasure as always. Before we go, we want to take a moment to remember the Chibok Girls of Nigeria. It has been five years since at least 276 schoolgirls were kidnapped by the Islamist militant group Boko Haram. It prompted worldwide outrage and spawned the social media hashtag, Bring Back Our Girls. Now, five years later, more than 100 of the girls are still unaccounted for. Some of those who either escaped or were freed are now studying at the American University of Nigeria in a program specifically designed for them to catch up on their studies. And four are studying in the U.S. at a similar program at Dickinson College. In April, on the five-year anniversary of the kidnappings, Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari reiterated his promise to bring the rest of the students back and reunite them with their families. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice of America. You can also like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta or follow Greta on Twitter at Greta. As always, thanks for being plugged in.